week. Good morning, everybody. So yesterday we started a series about um, the uh, what's it called? About the uh, the sitter, about the daily devotions of the Orthodox Jew, um, with reflections on the Hasidic Jew as well. So it's not only the sitter, but the, the daily devotions in general. So. It took us 45 minutes to get from Moda Ani to Elakai Neshama. I don't have 45 minutes right now. I have about 10 minutes to talk. And so I want to share something about uh, Birkas and Torah. <coughs> Which is, you know, just letting people know who are not from our circles, you know, everything that I just spoke for 45 minutes about takes about a minute or two, you know, to actually say. Um, I mean, obviously it takes more time than that, you know, to get dressed or whatever, but, but the actual recitation, not that long. Um, but at, I spoke about for, for 45 minutes and just barely scratched the surface. We could, we could talk for hours and hours about that about each thing that we spoke about, just to give an idea of the depth of the Jewish faith. So the next part, I would say, is one of the most important parts of our daily devotions, believe it or not. Um, Not the most important, but one of the most important uh, from what we consider a Torah standpoint, according to how most of the rabbis interpret And there are many reasons why it's very important, and that is Birkas Torah. That would be the blessings that we recite to thank God every day for the Torah. And in general, anytime we do a mitzvah, we say a bracha, we say a blessing to thank God for giving us these commandments. And so to hear we thank God for the Torah every day. And according to some interpretations, there are only two brachas that essentially fulfill a biblical obligation by their recitation. Two blessings that we fulfill a biblical obligation. By blessing, I mean uh, this formula that we say, Baruchat Vashem, Blessed art thou, O Lord, which those three words appear in Psalm 119, but they also appear in Chronicles. So they are biblically sourced in this part of our liturgy. and But generally it has Shemu Malchus that we mentioned, Baruchat Vashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, the King of the Universe. And that's a standard formula for for blessing, but some blessings only have the end, Baruch to Hashem, and then the next part, they start off with something else, and so forth, like Elokai Neshama. Um, and that being said, there's a whole question about the following, the Birkas of Torah, how many blessings are actually involved? Is it two or three blessings? Um, and uh, generally we'll consider it to be two practical reasons. So let's understand what is this uh, blessing of the Torah and where do we derive that it's a biblical obligation. It's not such an obvious biblical obligation. There are two blessings that we say are biblical obligations and all the other blessings are essentially rabbinical obligations even though rabbinical obligations fulfill biblical mandates and sometimes fulfill them just simple common sense that we have to thank God for whatever he gives us but that being said there is a a rather clear mandate to thank God for food and so in Deuteronomy it says you should eat and be satisfied and bless the Lord your God for the food which he has given you 
and for the land which he has given you. Uh, you know, that after you eat, you're supposed to thank God. Which is interesting, generally in the secular world, it's understood to thank God before we eat. Um, which we also do. But we say, in our tradition, we say that to thank God before eating, which is probably better known among most Jews uh, who are familiar somewhat with our liturgy, um, that we thank God before we eat, but we also thank God after we eat, which is a little bit less known, although actually more important, actually a biblical obligation to thank God after you eat. I remember some years ago meeting someone who, who said, you know, he only wanted to follow biblical laws, so he didn't want to eat chicken with cheese and whatever. And uh, he was at a Thanksgiving meal, and, and then he said, uh, we would, you know, and I asked if he would participate in benching in the race after the meals. He said, well, I didn't wash, I didn't say a mozi, whatever. So this is said, but did you eat bread? He said, yes, yeah. so then he's still obligated. From your from your standpoint, that you want to only follow biblical law, you have to you have to bench after the meal. We're not talking about benching right now. We're talking about the other. Now that that's pretty much universally understood that after you eat, that you have a biblical obligation to thank God. <clears throat> but then there's this other, according to most understandings, a biblical obligation, even though it's not so obvious context of the, the verse in Deuteronomy 32, uh, but yet it, it says, Ki shem shem kain, and when I call out to the name of the, on the name of the Lord, I will ascribe greatness to our God, it's in Deuteronomy 32, that uh, our rabbis interpret that based on our tradition. That that means that we are, and, and the tradition seems to be uh, a God-given tradition from, that Moses brought down from Sinai. That this verse teaches us that we're obligated to thank God for God's word, which we see in other traditions as well. To to thank God for giving the Bible, for giving Scripture, uh, is something that you find. In, Many various traditions. And so, to in our tradition, we believe that we are obligated to thank God for Scripture. It's considered a very strong obligation, a biblical obligation, according to most of the rabbis. Um, but also, the failure to do so considered to be a grave sin. The sages say one of the reasons Jerusalem was destroyed was because people didn't say a blessing before a study of Torah. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. Because by reciting, and, and, and it would, I, and the way I understand it is as follows. A person on tzitzis or tefillin or something like that, right? Sheikh Alulav, whatever it is. These type of mitzvahs are pretty much clear why you would do it, even though the whole discussion, mitzvah tzrichas kavana, mitzvah ain't tzrichas kavana, what does it mean? Do we, do we need to have intent to do mitzvah and so forth? Yes, no, it was a whole debate. In the Talmud, it's a debate. And yet we say that essentially they do. But it's pretty clear if you're doing something pretty much out of the ordinary, 
like putting on tefillin, tzitzis, shaking a lulav. Those type of things are pretty obvious that you're doing these things in religious devotion. Other things might not be as obvious. I would say eating in the sukkah or or eating matzah, even though they are <coughs> religious devotions. One might think, well, you're eating matzah because you're hungry, or you're sitting in the sukkah because you want a nice breeze, we want shade. So perhaps with, with those, there is more of this concept of mitzvah striches kavana that we need to state our intention but with all of them we state our intention by reciting a bracha and perhaps even before that to say a lefshei michud a Kabbalistic formula perhaps as well uh, which is the same thing with Torah study now Torah study is a little bit different because it's not so obvious that this is a religious devotion. And so by failing to thank God for the commandment to study His Word, not only for receiving His Word, but the, the concept that we are fulfilling God's Word by studying God's Word, that, that God commands us in His Word to study His Word, to recite His Word, contemplate on it, to meditate on it, whatever it is, to work in it. it it's, it's not totally obvious from the action that someone is doing this is religious devotion. And so we have to make it clear why we're doing it. That as a religious devotion, we are studying God's Word. We're studying Torah. Uh, and without that, it's, if we're missing something. It seems like it would just be an intellectual pursuit, just a pastime, reading a book. And that's not what it is. It's supposed to be a transformative experience and a religious devotion. devotion that many Jews devote a, a large amount of their life to. And some even take it up as a profession. And so all of this being said... Essentially, this is what we are obligated in. It is to recognize that all day when we study Torah, we're fulfilling an obligation in God's Word. And the question is, you know, other mitzvahs, every time we do it, we might say bracha, but because the obligation is constant, day and night, to study God's Word, it's sufficient to only recharge every every day, every morning. But it's very important not to study Torah before one recites the blessings of the Torah, because it's essentially a sin, or it's a failure to fulfill an obligation. It's and then it's a mark of disrespect to Torah if one does not verbalize the fact that it is a religious devotion. Let's get into the the liturgy, the text of Mirkus and Torah. Some by the Hasidim, uh, by some Hasidim and others, some of uh, the Kabbalistically inclined Sephardim. There is the recitation of the Shem Yichud. Before saying this, Get into that. We don't have that much time right now. We're almost to work. Um, so the actual text of the blessing is Bruch Atu Hashem Alkin Malucha Elam Asher Kedushanim Mitzvah Seventy One Vlasuk B'Divrei Sora. That's how it starts. Blessed thou art thou, O Lord, our God, the King of the Universe, who 
has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us, you know, made us holy by his mitzvahs, and commanded us to toil, to work hard in the words of uh, in, in the words of Torah. The Sephardic version, I don't mean Nusach Sephard, Nusach Sephard says the same like Ashkenaz, like we just said, but the Sephardic version is instead of Lasok B'Divrei Sora, to work hard in the words of Torah, it's al Torah, it's concerning the words of Torah. I recalled Sephardic Chachamim who were jealous of the Ashkenazic version there. I have to talk to Rabbi Siegel and find out what the. Because generally Rabbi Siegel teaches that whatever is the Sephardic halacha is the real halacha, and the Ashkenazim have been talking. That's what Rabbi Siegel generally teaches, and I have to find out from him what he has to say about this. The, the blessing continues. Haravna. Um, and the question is, is this a separate blessing or a continuation of the first one? And even if it's a separate blessing, because it doesn't start with the Baruch HaTashem, it has to be connected. So we don't say Amen, uh, according to most opinions, after Lazuk B'Tabrisor or al Torah. We say, Harev Noshem Al-Kinus Deris Rascha B'Fini B'Yuzam B'Yisrael. Yeah, Nachnu, it's a Tzenu. We ask that God should sweeten the words of the Torah. Please sweeten, Lord our God, the words of your Torah in our mouths and the mouths of our, our children and our children's children and the mouths of all different versions of how to say it, in the mouths of all thy people, the house of Israel. And that we and our children, children, children should all be knowing your name. And we should study your Torah for its own sake. And then it continues. Blessed thou, O Lord, who teaches Torah to his people Israel. Um, and then the next blessing, which is the same one that we say before a Torah reading in the synagogue, um, and we can discuss that at a later point, and also the fact that if you didn't say Birk as a Torah, it's enough that you said have a Rabba or have a Sola before Priyashma, we'll get into that. The exact Nusach, the exact liturgy that isn't that important as much as the, the, the fact that we're thanking God. The next blessing is Ruchat Hashem <coughs> Bless our Thou, Lord, our God, the King of the Universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us His Torah. Bless our Thou, Lord, the giver of the Torah. At that point, we then study some Torah <coughs> because after you say a blessing right away, you're supposed to do that mitzvah. And so we begin our Torah study for the day with sections from the Bible, from the Mishnah, and from the Gemara, the, the two parts of the Talmud, the Mishnah and the Gemara. The biblical reading is Berkos Kohanim from this week's Torah portion from Numbers chapter 6, May the Lord bless you and keep you, and so forth. People are familiar with that according to Nusach Svard, and I believe this Svardim as well, it's preceded and, 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 and post- uh, uh, posted, I don't know, by um, by the previous and the following verses as well. We then have a mission in Peya, the first mission in Peya, Elud Varim, Shein Lam Shior. These are the things that have no set limit of how much you have to give. We don't have to get into these. Um, and there's a whole discussion. Uh, and then Eilu The Gemara says these are the things a person eats. The reward in this world and the main reward is still set in the world to come. Um, it's well known. You can see in the Siddur what they are. Elohein Gimel Sachsadim Mishkamas Mikar Cholim. Bias and Mace, Kala, and 
but I'm not getting it in the order right now because I'm kind of nervous because I'm at work already. Cause, so I really have to finish this off now with some Torah connected Kulam. All these various things um, that we're obligated in and, uh, and the study of Torah is equal to them all. All right, so thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe. Um, basic, you know, mental. Right, thank you.